Hi everyone, my name is Connor, and today I will be taking you through the history and current knowledge of the histamine 2 receptor antagonist drug class. H2 antagonists are a type of antihistamine, although the, the term antihistamine usually refers to H1 antagonists, which respond to allergic reactions. Today, we'll be learning about what diseases H2 antagonists are used for, the specific target for this class, lead discovery and optimization, and finally, successor drugs. To begin, what are H2 antagonists used for? H2 antagonists are commonly used to treat gastroesophageal disease and peptic ulcer disease. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, better known as GERD or acid reflux disease, is a condition that occurs when the stomach acid flows into the esophagus and irritates the lining. Common symptoms include heartburn and a sour taste in the mouth. A review published in 2005 estimates that gastroesophageal disease has a prevalence of 10 to 20 percent in Western countries, compared to Asian nations that have a prevalence of less than 5 percent. Gastric ulcer disease is a condition that occurs when stomach acid reacts to the lining of the stomach to the point that results in sores or even holes. The only difference between duodenal ulcers and gastric ulcers is the location of the ulcer. Symptoms can range from stomach pains and nausea to internal bleeding. A review published in 2009 found that 17 out of 100,000 Americans were hospitalized with PUD. In comparison, only 7 out of 100,000 in Finland and 3 out of 100,000 in the Netherlands were hospitalized. The CDC estimates that each year there are 500,000 to 850,000 new cases of PUD around the world. Even today, there is therefore still a huge need for acid reflux medications. As the name suggests, H2 antagonists work by binding to, to the histamine H2 receptors of the parietal cells in the stomach. By binding to the receptors, H2 antagonists effectively block histamines from binding to the receptor and thus blocking the necessary signal to reduce stomach acid. So how were the original H2 antagonists developed? The lead discovery of H2 antagonists was significant because the researchers used a new approach to drug discovery. In the past, they would start with natural products such as a plant extract with biological activity and would then make a lot of similar compounds and test them for effectiveness as drug candidates. But Smith, Klein, and French, which later became GlaxoSmithKline, used a new model of drug discovery and actually started with the histamine molecule, which stimulates acid secretion when it binds to the receptor. They essentially wanted to find a compound that would compete with histamine by binding to the receptor, but would then block instead of cause acid secretion. This is an agonist-antagonist model. The agonist, the model that stimulates action at the receptor site, which is in this case histamine, stimulating stomach acid secretion, competes with the antagonist, a molecule that blocks this action by using a similar but inactive chemical. This idea had been used before in developing beta blockers to block the action of adrenaline. At the time, in 1964, antihistamines already existed, but they did not block secretion of stomach acid. This led the Smith, Klein, and French researchers to believe that there are two types of histamine receptors. They focused on the type that controlled gastric acid secretion, called H2 receptors, and wanted to find histamine antagonists that would selectively inhibit acid secretion. Using this new approach, Sir James Black and other researchers at Smith, Klein, and French started with the agonist histamine and modified the sidechain amino group. They tried replacing the sidechain amino group with a guanidine. Guanidine is a strongly basic group that is protonated at physiological pH. It was a promising functional group because its derivatives have a, have a wide range of biological properties, such as antimicrobial properties and inhibition of amines. For example, guanidinium, which is positively charged, has a high affinity for anionic sites and biological systems. This creates the potential of guanidine to antagonize amines at receptor sites. This lead, a histamine with the guanidine, became known as N-alpha guanyl histamine. Smith, Klein, and French tested activity of N-alpha guanyl histamine against the H2 receptor and found that it was a partially active antagonist on gastric acid secretion. After two years of modifying N-guanyl histamine, the same research group discovered the first active antagonist, buramide. Buramide contained a thiourea group instead of the amine in N-guanyl histamine. This lead wasn't orally active and not extremely potent. So the researchers continued modifying the compound. The new analog, mediamide, was modified to change the methylene in the carbon chain to a thioether, along with adding a methyl group to the imidazole ring. These changes altered the ionization and lipid solubility of the compound, 
making it more easily absorbed in the intestines, while still functional in the stomach. Metiamide was found to be orally active and far more potent. The IC50 value was roughly 10 times lower than that of buramide. In clinical trials in 1973 with metiamide, patients with stomach ulcers were healed within three weeks. This was a really exciting step in lead optimization. However, one of the side effects of metiamide was a blood disorder called agranulocytosis. Agranulocytosis is a condition in which a person's white blood cell count reaches dangerously low levels. So, Black and his team decided to continue to modify metiamide in hopes of avoiding this adverse effect. The compound they ultimately produced still contained the thioether and methyl group, but the thiourea group at the end of the side chain was changed to the cyanoguanidine group that's seen here. This compound was called cimetidine, and it became the first drug in this class of H2 receptor antagonists. It was discovered in 1971 and became commercially available in 1977. Pharmacokinetic reports later came out showing that the compound was a weak base and highly water soluble based off its experimental log p value. As you can see here, the compound also followed the rest of Lipinski's rules. Along with the following basic structure rules to make the drug effective, cimetidine showed really high systemic clearance of about 500 to 600 milliliters per minute and was determined to have primarily renal clearance. The half life showed to be about two hours and the duration of action is roughly four to five hours. The volume of distribution has never been well quantified for cimetidine, but it's been mentioned that it is of the order of one liter per kilogram, which is about equal to that of body weight. Following oral administration, researchers found that there were two plasma concentration peaks and determined that this is probably due to discontinuous absorption in the intestine. The absolute bioavailability ranges based on the population taking cimetidine. In healthy subjects, the bioavailability is about 60%, but in patients with peptic ulcer disease, it is about 70%. In both populations, there is 20% plasma protein binding, which in some cases is dangerous and leads to changes in bioavailability. However, the researchers believe that there is no relevant effect of changes in binding on the pharmacokinetics of cimetidine. The drug is primarily excreted through urine in two major metabolites, representing 25 to 40% of the total elimination. When given intravenously, 50 to 80 percent is recovered in urine as unchanged cimetidine. The fraction is much less in oral doses, but is independent of the amount of the dose. 40 percent is recovered unchanged in oral administration. Overall, cimetidine proved to be a very exciting new drug, although there were still concerns with its design. Going forward, there were two main areas for improvement on cimetidine. One, cimetidine, though effective at reducing gastric acid secretions, only could do so through massive dosing up to 300 milligrams four times daily. Cimetidine also has several problematic drug interactions, most likely owing to its imidazole rings resemblance to histamine. Cimetidine thus has a high affinity for six cytochrome P450 enzymes, including CYP3A4, leading to several drug interactions. Cimetidine also has a high affinity for androgen and related hormones, causing adverse effects including impotence and gynecomastia in men. Drug discoverers therefore sought to improve cimetidine's activity while reducing or eliminating its significant adverse effects. Beginning just after cimetidine's release onto the market in 1977, drug discoverers at Glaxo and Merck began to find alternatives. In 1984, the FDA approved two new H2 antagonist drugs. Both drugs, ranitidine and famotidine, maintained the aromatic heterocycle characteristic of histamine to preserve the antagonistic mechanism. Ranitidine, developed by Glaxo and originally marketed as Zantac, substituted a furan ring in place of cimetidine's imidazole ring and added a nitro group to improve binding. These structural changes resulted not only in a fourfold increase in potency that allowed for smaller dosages of just 150 mg twice daily, but also a tenfold reduction in P450 interactions, making the drug much more tenable long term. The trade off, however, was a reduced bioavailability of just 50%. So ranitidine was developed as an oral, injectable, and intravenous drug. The only major side effects for ranitidine include mild headaches and skin rashes in less than 3% of cases. Due to this higher tolerability, ranitidine quickly superseded cimetidine as the premier H2 antagonist drug of the 1980s. In 1987, Zantac became the world's top selling drug for millions of people seeking relief from acid reflux diseases. Thimotidine was simultaneously developed by Merck. 
In place of cimetidine's imidazole ring, Merck researchers substituted a thiazole ring with an attached guanidine group in addition to a terminal pyrilidyl group. These substitutions led to a 32-fold potency increase over that of cimetidine and a 9-fold improvement over ranitidine, translating to smaller 20 mg doses taken twice daily. Like ranitidine, famotidine lacks the cytochrome P450 interactions and androgen affinity present in cimetidine, so the drug interactions and hormonal side effects are similarly reduced. Despite this impressive, long-lasting activity, famotidine's bioavailability of just 43% in an unfavorable lip lipophilicity with a minuscule log P of negative 0.64 translate to a slower onset inhibition due the, to the comparatively polar molecules difficulties in crossing the parietal cell's membrane. As such, providers and patients are more likely to prefer ranitidine among H2 blockers due to its favorable side effect profile, considerable potency, and quick relief mechanism upon ingestion. To combat the challenges of oral bioavailability, Pharma sought further drug discovery during the late 1980s. In 1987, researchers from Eli Lilly combined several structural elements from ranitidine, namely the trimethylamine and nitro groups, with the thiazole ring of hematidine to create nizatidine, marketed as Tazek or Axid. The main benefit was much improved bioavailability of 70%, though its potency and half-life were similar to those of ranitidine. Roxotidine, patented as Roxit in 1988, attained a bioavailability of 80%, perhaps owing to the novel additions of a phenyl group with a nitrogen heterocyclic substituent, combined with the restructuring of the long amine arm with new amide and ester functionalities. These additions translated to a two-fold potency improvement over ranitidine that was delivered with only a single nightly 150 mg dose. Roxotidine would have been a game changer for the treatment of PUD and GERD had it not been for the release of the first proton pump inhibitor, omeprazole, or Prilosec, in 1987. In contrast to the reversible inhibition of the histamine receptor by H2 antagonists, PPIs covalently bind to the ATPase proton pump in gastric parietal cells, yielding irreversible inhibition and substantially longer half-lives. While the average half-life for an H2 antagonist is 3 hours, PPIs are 24. Omeprazole thus spelled the end of the line for the H2 blockers as to premier gastric acid drugs. Though today they are still available as generic and over-the-counter drugs that, owing to their age and lower efficacy, are often affordable options for moderate acid reflux. This is reflected in ranitidine's ongoing status as the third highest growing antacid drug behind Nexium and Prilosec which are both PPIs. Going forward, H2 blockers are likely to maintain their roles as treatment for peptic disorders, though ongoing research into H2 blockers' role in potentially treating autism and other neural conditions means there's still potential for this fascinating drug class. Thank you for watching, and we hope that you learned something about H2 receptor antagonists.